uh, as we get into God's Word. How many of you love Jesus this morning? Yes. Amen. Are you ready to hear God's Word? Yes. All right. Praise the Lord. If you're just joining us, we're in a series that I've entitled, Living Your Best Life. Living Your Best Life. You know, I can, I can honestly tell you that this week, I've been praying for every single one of you. I've been praying that you would be living your best life, that God would, would be stirring your heart and challenging you to live the best life that you could possibly be living, right? And that's something that uh, I'm praying for and, and believing God is going to be doing in your life. Now, if you were here last week in part one of our series, we looked at how the first way you begin to live your best life is by faith in Jesus Christ, obviously, but also by learning how to live positively, by learning how to live positively and not being negative, but having a positive outlook in life. How many of you are learning to do that? All right. All right. Most of us. It's so important that we live with the outlook of faith, with a positive attitude, because, you know, we live in a world that's full of negativism. There's a lot of negative things in the world. There's a lot of things that we can become critical about, cynical about. And so it's so important that we cultivate having eyes of faith, attitudes of faith that are looking at things from a positive lens. Because if not, you will be swallowed up. You will be overwhelmed in negativity and you'll become this cynical person. And I can tell you that is not what God wants for you. And that is not living your best life, you know, being a critical uh, person. And so God wants you to live positively. Today in part two of our series, I want to look at another characteristic of our faith that is not just living positively, but living expectantly. Living expectantly. Now, Jesus says something, and I want you to really look what he says in Matthew 9, 29. He says, according to your faith, let it be done to you. Let me say it again. According to your faith, let it be done to you. In other words, because you believe what I say, you will receive what I say. Because you believe what I say, you're going to receive what I say. I wonder this morning, what are your aspirations? What are your expectations in life? I mean, think about that. I want you to ask yourself that right now. What are your aspirations? What are your expectations in life? What, if any, are your faith expectations of God? What are you believing God for in your life right now? Some of you might say a couple of things, but some of you, you know, haven't even thought about it. But, you know, it's so important that we learn to cultivate a heart of expectancy, a heart of expectancy. The reason why I ask you this question is because there is a spiritual law that God has established that is just as real as the physical law of gravity, right? And it's the law of expectation. It's the law of expectation. You see, it's a proven fact that we tend to get what we expect out of life. How many of you know that's true? We tend to get what we expect out of life. We tend to see things we expect to see. We tend to hear things we expect to hear. We tend to feel the way we expect to feel. This is why if you get up in a grumpy mood and you're feeling that way, you're thinking, oh, the whole day is going to be this way, right? And so we tend to feel the way we expect to feel. We tend to accomplish what we expect to accomplish. And I was reading about a shoe company who once sent two salesmen to a remote village to see if there was a market for their shoes. And after seeing the situation, the first salesman reported back, man, this is a hopeless uh, situation. No one here wears shoes. I thought maybe he was in Hawaii or something. I don't know. But no one wears shoes. You know, so he was depressed. Whereas the second salesman saw the same village and excitedly reported back, this is a huge opportunity because nobody has shoes. Nobody has shoes. Both salesmen saw the same reality, but their expectations shaped 
how they viewed it, right? The first salesman saw the obstacle, while the second salesman saw the potential. You know, this really demonstrates for us how our expectations can influence not only what we see, but affect how we respond to life situations. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? I mean, the lesson here is quite clear. If we expect opportunities, we're likely to find them. If we expect opportunities, we're likely to find them, even in unexpected places, right? Some of you are, you know, you want certain things, but then you don't live with that expectancy. You don't live with that anticipation. And so it's important that you learn to cultivate, again, the law of expectation. The truth is God says you get what you choose. The degree to which you're willing to believe will be what you get in proportion to your faith. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. According to your faith, let it be done to you. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God without faith, right? How many of you are parents in this place? Let me see. If you're a parent in this place, how many of you are pleased when your kids trust you? How many of you are pleased when they, I mean, I think every single parent in this place, you know, is blessed knowing that my kids trust me implicitly. They trust me. Well, God is no different. God, as our Heavenly Father, is pleased when we trust Him, when we look to Him in faith. You see, without faith, it is impossible to please God. This is why it's important we learn to live lives of expectancy, right? To live expectantly because faith without expectancy, or you know what I mean, is not really faith. Faith without inspect expectancy is not real faith. True faith is always accompanied with the expectation of receiving, Right? You guys hear me? Because you can say that you have faith, but let me ask you, are you living with the reality that, hey, you know what? If I'm praying in accordance to the will of God, I'm going to receive what God says. I'm going to receive what God says in God's way, in God's time, and once again, according to the will of God. I'm not talking about anything that's outside of the realm of what God says in his word, but as the Bible says, if we pray according to the will of God, we have the very request that, we, that we've asked for. And so, again, it's important that we learn to cultivate this kind of expectancy because without it, you're not really operating in faith. True faith is always accompanied with the expectation of receiving. The Bible says this in James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Listen, when you ask... You must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Look what he says. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Wow. Right? So, Scripture is clear. It's like a person who doesn't cultivate that expectancy, who's, who asks God for things and says they has faith, but yet the next minute is saying, you know what, this is never going to happen for me. I'm never going to meet that guy. I'm never going to have that child. I'm ne if, you, if that's your attitude, well, be, that's what's going to be done for you. And so you cannot speak that. You know what I mean? You can't say those kind of things. You need to believe with expectancy, you, you got to believe God because faith is always accompanied with expectancy. This is why the apostles asked Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. You know, and I wonder this morning, how many of you need to be asking God that very thing? Lord, increase my faith. And maybe because instead of being optimistic, you're always pessimistic. Instead of being positive, you're always critical, judgmental, you know, and, and maybe it, it's you need to start asking God, God, increase my faith so that I see the things that you want me to see through the lens of your eyes. For me personally, if having more faith is what pleases God, guess what? That's what I want. 
I want what God, what, what pleases the heart of God. And so the question then becomes this morning, how does God build my faith? How does God build my faith? If faith is what pleases God and enriches our lives, how does God build my faith? I mean, is there a vitamin that we can take? You know what I mean? That would be great, right? Because these days, everything, you pop a pill and that's the answer, right? If there was a pill that I could take to fill my head, I believe me, I would take it. You know what I mean? But there, there's not. Is there a therapy that you can, you can go through to acquire more faith? No. Can you take a semester of college or a college course and gain more faith? No. God doesn't build or increase our faith in any of these ways. And so if you're taking notes, which I would encourage you to do because we don't have it on the screen, you know, how does God build our faith? God builds my faith by testing it. I want that just to kind of settle in. God builds my faith by testing it. You've heard me say this a million times. A faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted, right? And so God builds my faith by testing it. And I would venture to say this morning that every single one of us and I know this to be true, and I'll prove it to you, but every single one of us are being tested whether you recognize it or not. Your faith is being tested right now. Your faith is being tested. God builds our faith by testing it. I wonder in what area is God doing that for you right now? Faith is like a muscle. It has to be worked. It has to be stretched. It has to be pulled. It has to be tried in order to grow. Just like muscles develop when you test them against pressure and weights, your faith only develops as it's tested. As it's tested. You don't develop faith simply by being, you know, by having your blessed assurance sitting here and just, you know, that your faith is, is not, not going to be tested that way. You develop faith by having it tried and tested. Listen to what the Bible says in James chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. The testing of your faith produces perseverance so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The testing of your faith produces perseverance so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You know, Job speaks of this from his own personal experience. Listen carefully to what Job says in Job chapter 7, verses 17 and 18. He says, What is man that you make so much of him that you give him so much attention? Listen to what he says. That you examine him every morning and test him every moment. That's how I know that we're all being tested right now. It says that. This is what the Bible says. It says that we are examined every morning by God and tested by Him every moment. We are constantly being tested by the Lord. Tested with our attitudes. Tested with our actions. Tested with our integrity. Tested with our choices. Ch tested with our morals, with our values, tested with our money, tested with all kinds of things, tested whether or not you're paying attention because God wants to speak to you or if you're thinking about lunch right now. We're constantly being tested, constantly being tested. The scripture says it. These two verses here in Job teach us something that most of us are completely oblivious of, right? And what is that? That whether or not you recognize it, every day God is testing you. Are you going to look twice? You see that hot chick walking by? I mean, are you going to, what are you, you going to do one of these? God, God's, God's looking at you. Are you at, at Costco, all of a sudden you get $20 more back? Are you thinking, oh, praise God, I got 20 bucks, right? Or are you going to go back? I'll tell you what, this has happened to Kathy and I on numerous occasions where we've gotten to Costco and we, and we realize that we didn't pay for something. 
And I kid you not, we drive back. We drive back, and we tell them, like, you know what? We didn't, you know, somehow this was missed, and we were looking at the receipt. We show you we didn't, we didn't pay for it. And oftentimes they'll tell us, ah, just don't worry about it. But you know what? We don't let it slide because, you know what? It's an offense to God. That's stealing, right? And so God will test you in areas like that. He's always watching you. And here's the thing. If you can't be faithful in little things, what makes you think that God will entrust you with greater things? You're constantly being tested. We are constantly being tested. Whether you recognize it or not, right? Every day we are presented with faith-building opportunities. Faith-building opportunities where our faith is tested. You see, the challenges, the trials, the hard, the blessings you encounter every day in your life aren't just these random things. God uses all of it to test you. Even the blessings, even the blessings, are you just going to hoard it to yourself? Oh, man, I've come into this large sum of money, so it's just for me. You know, it's, man, I'm going to be living the high life. Or are you going to recognize that God has blessed you so that you can be a blessing? You see, God tests you with those things. God is not going to give you more if if he recognizes that I can't trust this person with more. God uses it all. The problems, you know, most of us are oblivious to the fact that the events that come our way are meant to test and to teach Uh, some of the greatest life lessons that we will ever receive. You know, and so this is why God does it. It's one of the reasons why we often fail God's test. Why? Because we're oblivious to the reality that life, as you've heard it said and heard me say, is the ultimate classroom. And how many of you know that in class or in school, there are tests? And that tests are invaluable to understanding your aptitude. They're valuable in understanding, finding out where you are, right? That's just it. And so we are in the classroom of life, and we are constantly being tested with who we are. God is always looking at things. And so if God wants me to live by faith, and if God builds my faith by testing it, the natural question then becomes this. How does God test my faith? How does God test my faith? And this morning, I want to give you four ways God will test our faith so that you will be aware and prepared. How many of you know when you're not prepared for a test, chances are you're going to fail the test, right? But the more studied you are, the more prepared you are, the more ready you are to take the test, right? And so I'm going to give you Four ways, two of which I will cover today. Be thankful because I broke the message in two because God recognized that our projector is broken. And so this is this way you'll be able to track with me easier. Um, But four ways God will test our faith so that you will be aware and prepared for them. And he will test you in every one of these four areas, I promise you. You know, once you become aware of this reality again, you will be better prepared Better prepared. So this way, man, you come through the test and you feel like, man, I got an A. I passed that test. I got an A, right? So mark it. I'm going to ask some of you next week. As a matter of fact, you know what? I might even do this. If, 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 if you were tested, which not if, you will be, but I guarantee all of us will, will experience at least one of these tests this week that we can count on. And come and talk to me Sunday, and if it's a good enough story, maybe I'll have you come up and share it, all right? The question is, how does God test our faith? If you're taking notes, write this down. First, God tests our faith, which I've already alluded to, through difficulties. God tests our faith through difficulties, trials, troubles, problems, pressures, setbacks, You know, hard circumstances, God uses all of these things. All of these things are a fact of life in this broken world that we live in. There is no escaping that. We live in a world that's broken. Everything's broken. You just saw in Florida, the weather's broken. 
I mean, it's just terrible. But listen to what the Bible says, 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. Now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come, look what it says, so that your faith may be proved or tested genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I'm going to read it again. Now for a while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials or various kinds. How many of you know that trials come in 31 flavors? There's all kinds. Trials come in different shapes and sizes, different forms. They come in all kinds. They come in a variety of ways. But look what it says. These have come so that your faith may be proved or tested to be genuine, right? God wants you to be so assured that your faith is genuine. Why? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus said, broad is the road that leads unto destruction, but narrow is the road that leads unto life. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not do this in your name? Jesus will respond, I never knew you. Depart from me. Wow. There will be a great many people who will be self-deceived and deluded to believing that they were true believers, that they had true faith, only to discover that their faith was counterfeit. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. That is a sobering reality. And so this is why God does this. God does this because he loves us so much because he wants to make sure that we know that our faith is the real thing. How many of you know that when you purchase something, you want to know that you got the real deal? You don't want some knockoff. You don't want some counterfeit unless you intentionally are trying to buy a counterfeit, which some of you are okay with. I don't know what it is about myself, but I'm not into that kind of stuff. If I'm going to get something If I'm going to invest my hard-earned money into something, I want the real deal. I don't want some Apple knockoff. I want the Apple whatever, right? I don't want this, you know, you know, pleather. I want real leather. You know what I'm saying? I want the real deal, right? And so God wants you to know that you are the real deal, and so He will allow various things to come into your life. Difficulties, hardships, trials, tribulations, right? To prove that your faith is real. But here's the thing that I want to encourage you with because some of you are thinking, man, I don't, that doesn't sound fun. Sometimes it's not. But let me, let me say something to you that's encouraging, and it's this. Everything that comes into your life is father filtered. You guys hear me? It's father filtered. God is not going to give you something you can handle. God is not going to put you through something that will destroy you. Everything is father filtered. We learned this last week where everything that happens to you either falls into one of two categories. It's either planned and ordained by God or it is permitted by God. Everything that comes into your life is father filtered. You know, so he's not going to give you more than you can bear. God has his hand on the thermostat. When things are getting hot, he knows your breaking point. But again, he is doing that for a reason. You know, in some instances, right, God even customizes the trials that we encounter. He customizes the things that we encounter, again, to teach us, to try us, to impart faith in us in order to reveal to us the genuineness of our faith. As a matter of fact, the prime example of this is the prophet Jonah, right? Jonah is a prime example of this where God customizes a problem that swallowed him up, literally speaking, to get this attention. By the way, which I think is interesting you know, a lot, of, a lot of people like to criticize, oh, yeah, really, he got swallowed up by a whale. Did you know last year, or maybe a couple of years now, there was an article, and this literally happened, of a man who got swallowed up by a whale, a whale and spit out again and survived. I mean, and so there are, you know, people like to, 
uh, to cite Jonah and say, oh yeah, that's how I know the Bible's false. Oh really? This just, just, this just happened. But sometimes God orchestrates situations that swallow you up or you have nowhere else to turn but to God. And I know this firsthand because that's how I came to faith. That's how I came to faith. Things had gotten so, I had hit the ground and there was nowhere else to go. You couldn't go any lower than I had come. And I had nowhere else to look or to turn but to God. And that's how I came to faith. And God does that sometimes. He customizes and orchestrates situations to bring you to himself, to bring you to a place of faith. If life were easy, it wouldn't require any faith. This is why God uses difficulties. Isaiah 48.10 says this, See, I have refined you, though not as silver, but I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Whenever the heat is on, listen to what I'm going to say to you. Whenever you're feeling the pressure of things, maybe at work because of a deadline, maybe at home, maybe in your marriage, maybe in your family, when the heat is on, when you feel, you're being tested. How are you going to conduct yourself? Are you going to be fair? Are you going to be just? Are you going to do the right thing? Or are you going to do what the world does? Are you going to do what everybody else does, right? You are being tested. When the heat is on, your character is being tested. You know, the Bible frequently compares our trials and our difficulties to a furnace that gets so hot that is used to purify gold and silver, where it is refined in the fire, and all the impurities are removed. They come to the surface, and all the impurities are removed. You know, uh, uh, a silversmith was once asked the question, how do you know when the impurities are burned away? And this is his response. He said, when I can see my reflection in the silver, I know the silver is pure. Well, the same is true with God and us. When God can see his reflection in you, in your character, in how you behave and how you respond, he knows that the impurities in your life have been taken away when he can see his reflection in you. And that's what God's doing. He allows these things. He turns up the heat because he wants to take the impurities out of your life. He wants to refine your character. He wants to refine who you are so that you can best represent who he is, right? That's what God wants to do. And so when he can see his reflection in you, God knows, okay, I can, I can turn off the heat for a while, right? When God can see his reflection in, in us, we know that good, thi good things are happening. And so God uses difficulties. He uses hardships to test our faith. Again, the question is, how are we supposed to respond? How do we respond? Let me ask you, how do you respond when things get tough? When the pressure is on, do you just cave in? Do you give in to peer pressure? Do you start compromising? Do you start lying? Do you start cheating? Do you start fudging? How do you respond when the pressure's on? Because I promise you, you're being tested. How do you respond? Listen to what the Bible says. When problems come, seeing how God is using them to test your faith, how should we respond? Well, again, quoting James chapter 1, look what he says. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials. Once again, James uses this term too. Various kinds, trials of various kinds, he says, right? 31 flavors. For you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, when you read this verse at first glance, I don't know about you, but it sounds a little strange to me. Count it all joy when you were faced with various kinds of problems? I mean, doesn't that sound a little uh, out of touch with reality? So what am I supposed to jump up and down and say, oh, my life is messed up. You know what I mean? I just lost my job. I just went bankrupt. Is that, is that what it's telling us to do? I mean, oh, man, my girlfriend of 10 years just broke up with me. I mean, so are we, we're supposed to just rejoice? Count it all joy? How does, how does that make any sense? But when you look at this verse... 
closely, it makes perfect sense. Listen to what James says. He says, when you encounter difficulty or hardship of some kind, look what he says, count it pure joy. Why? For you know, look what he says, the testing of your faith, look what he says, produces. Zoom in on that word. The testing of your faith produces. Produces what? It produces good things in your life. It produces perseverance. It produces maturity. It produces character. It produces the faith that pleases God. It produces. So he says, count it all joy. As a matter of fact, the word count here in the original Greek is actually a financial term that means to evaluate. It means to calculate, right? You know, as a matter of fact, Paul used this same word several times, the same word in Philippians chapter 3. When Paul became a Christian, he had to reevaluate his life and set new goals and priorities for himself because the things that were once important to him, the things that he deemed a priority in his life, he says, these things are garbage. They're trash. They don't mean anything to me now, right? He had to reevaluate his life. And so that word count is a financial term. It means to evaluate. It means to calculate. And so when things are happening in your life, right, God says, hey, you need to evaluate some things. And some of you right now need to do just that. You need to evaluate your life. You need to evaluate some things. You need to begin to, what is God saying to you? What is God trying to teach you? Because remember, life is the ultimate classroom. God is constantly teaching us life lessons. The question is, are we learning them? Are we learning them, right? And so we need to evaluate. We need to calculate you know, and so when we're experiencing the various trials that James is talking about, we need to evaluate them in the light of what God is doing in and through and for us. That's what you need to do. You need to evaluate what's happening inside of you. What's happening inside of you? What is God doing around you? Right? And what is God seeking to do for you through these things? Through these things, you know, I've been dealing with some physical ailments, some different things, and I've had to ask God, okay, God, you have my attention. What are you trying to teach me through this? What are you trying to teach me? And, you know, I can tell you, I, I can't say that I know for sure, but this is what I do know. I believe that God is trying to teach me, first of all, hey, you know what? I just trust the Lord. I'm trusting the Lord. And secondly, he's teaching me to have joy in spite of those things. And I do have joy. I have the joy of the Lord. I'm so grateful that I'm alive. I'm so grateful for my salvation. I'm so grateful for my family. I'm so grateful every morning that I get to take a breath. I'm grateful. You know, even the other day, you know, I had to park somewhere, and it was kind of far. And normally, I would have this kind of cringe on my face. Man, dude, where's the parking? Right? But you know what? I got out of the car, and I said, God, thank you that I'm not in a wheelchair, but I actually have the ability to walk and get there. You know, we take so many things for granted. We take so many things. And it's because of these, these my infirmities and my ailments, God is teaching me things about me. Dude, stop being a whiner. Stop being a whiner. How many of you mutter? How many of you know what muttering is? Muttering is when you speak under your breath. You know what I mean? You walk through the house, and you have little kids, and, there's, and you, oh, man, this kid can't put his toys away. Man, I got to do it now. You're muttering, you know? You go to work, and you're like, oh, man, somebody's in my parking space, you know, or whatever. But get, here's the thing. God hears all of it. God hears all of it. You know what I mean? And, and you know what? I, I don't want to stand up here and, and, and sound holier than thou, but I found myself muttering about a bunch of things. I found myself critical about some things. And uh, like I've shared with you maybe last week, in our time away, and Kathy and I intended to spend time with God, and we did. We went through a book together. We prayed together every day. And we, we, we intentionalized not just to, you know, to enjoy recreation, but we wanted time in fellowship with God. 
And God really met with us and spoke to us. And as I said, you know, things started to surface in my own heart, in my own life, that God was pinpointing. This is why I'm doing this. These things need to be addressed. They're not healthy. They're not good. And there are things in your life that God is, through the pressure, he's bringing to the surface. And he wants you to look at them. And he wants you to deal with them. Because he wants to purify your life. And so it's really important if you're going to live the life that God wants you to live, if you're going to live your best life, you need to understand the work that God is seeking to do, right? Even Jesus himself, the Bible says that he was able to endure the cross because of the joy that was set before him, Hebrews 12, 2. What joy was that? It was the joy of returning back to heaven and one day bringing all of us, his church, with him. He had the right perspective. He had the right focus. He had the right attitude, even as he was facing the cross. As horrible as that was, as excruciating, as painful as that was, he had the right focus, and he was able to have joy. And that's what God's teaching me, that in spite of my physical infirmities, in spite of the things that I've been dealing with that have been serious irritants in my life, you know what? God is still uh, teaching me to be joyful, to have a smile, to laugh about certain things. You know, now Pastor Steve and I, were always talking about, yeah, this is broken down in my life. And he's like, yeah, this is broken down for me. You know, the plumbing don't work that well. This ain't working. It's like, that's what, that's what happens, man. But you know what? We laugh about it. We laugh about it, and it, it is what it is. But you know what? We can still have joy, right? We, it, we can still have joy. Listen, it's important to recognize that your values determine your evaluations. You can write that down because that's a good quote. Your values determine your evaluations. Let me give you an example. If we value comfort more than character, then every inconvenience, every trial will make you bitter, not better, right? If, that was, if you value, man, I just need to be comfortable. I just need to be comfortable, you know, and you don't care about your character, then everything that comes into your life will embitter you, will aggravate you, will agitate you, will irritate you, right? You won't become better because you value comfort. If you only live for the present and aren't thinking about the future, then the trials will always get the best of you. If you value material and physical possessions more than the spiritual things that God wants to do, you won't be able to count it all joy because you have an earthly perspective. You're not thinking about what God has in store for you in the future. But when you consider how God is maturing and perfecting your faith through these difficulties and preparing you for future glory with him, guess what? Now you're able to count it all joy. You're able to evaluate things. You're able to calculate things even in the midst of maybe health problems or financial problems, or different problems. You're still able to recognize, yeah, this kind of stinks, but you know what? I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. Man, these, this stuff stinks, but you know what? God still loves me. God still has a plan for me. God promises good things for me, right? We're still able to have the joy of the Lord. We're able to count it all joy. And so when trials come our way, look at them through the lens of faith. Why? Because outlook always determ determines outcome. Outlook always determines outcome. Now, just so we're clear, again, God is not saying be joyful or thankful for problems themselves. Oh, I just went bankrupt. Thank you, Jesus. That's not what he's saying, right? That's not what this is saying. Oh, I just lost my job or I just got divorced. You know, I'm so thankful. No, that's not what God is saying. What the Bible is saying here is, we're to be thankful for how God is using these trials in our lives to mature us, to grow us. He's using them to bring good. And so remember, everything that you're going through in your life right now is father-filtered. And I know that you guys are going through things. Every single one of you are dealing with certain things in your life. God sees it, God knows it, but they're father-filtered. 
And so count it all joy, not because of the problem, but, but because of what God is going to do through the problem. Can you say amen? Amen. All right. So that's just my first point. Let's get to the second point. This is why I had to break it in two, okay? Uh, secondly, the law of expectation is seen in number two, if you're taking notes, God not only tests our faith through difficulties, God tests our faith through demands, through demands. There are 1,050 commands in the New Testament alone for us today. 1,050 commands just in the New Testament. Now, of those commands, some of them, if I'm just being honest, kind of sound and even seem unreasonable. Some of them are definitely inconvenient. Some of them really do appear to be impossible sometimes. But all of them are there for our own good, to test and to prove our faith to be genuine. The issue is, and I want you to follow me as I develop this thought because it's a powerful thought, but the issue is this, who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe what God says to do? Or am I going to believe what I think I should do? Who are you going to believe, right? Because all of these commands are there to test us, right? Like, let me give you an example. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, and in Philippians chapter 4, don't worry about anything, right? That's what it says. Don't worry about anything. Um, Jesus said in the Sermon on the do good to your enemies. Forgive others, it says. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, be thankful in all things. Be thankful in everything. Now, these are all commands. Every single one of those things I just mentioned to you, every single one of them is an imperative. How many of you know what an imperative is? It is a command, right? They're imperatives from God to you and to me. Now, listen closely to what I'm going to say to you. It's important. Every time God gives a command in the Bible, there's a demand, okay? Every time God gives a command, there's a demand placed on your life. And whether you realize it or not, Every command that comes with a demand is a test. It's a test. If God is saying, you need to be pure in that relationship, that is a test. It's not only a command with a demand, but God is testing your integrity. Are you going to honor me in that relationship? You see what I'm saying? Every command comes with a demand that is a test. And the test is, will we trust what God says to do, or are we going to do what we think or what I think is right in my own eyes to do? Let me give you an example. When God delivered the people uh, from their slavery in Egypt, he told them, go to the land that I promised you, which we know is the promised land, right? And he told them, don't worry about what you're going to eat because I'm going to provide bread for you. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us every day when they got there, he would, there was, there was this dough-like substance called manna that he would put to the ground, that they would be able to uh, form it into dough and bake it, and it would be this sweet-tasting bread, right? And so every day, God provided manna for them. But here was the condition. God said, gather enough only for today. Don't try to get more than for today. And why did he say that? He said, because I want you to depend on me every day. I don't want you to take more, right? Just take what you need. Why did God tell them that? Because he was testing them. And so some of them thought, you know what? Let's just take more so that we have extra for tomorrow. And guess what happened? It bred maggots. God told them, don't take more than you need than just for today. But some of them thought they were smarter than God, and they took more than they needed. Again, God was testing them right? God was testing them. He wanted them to learn how to depend on him every day, every day, right? Exodus 16, 4 says, God says, the people are to go out each day and gather enough manna for that day. In that way, look what he says very clearly, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Man, God is speaking to some of you very loudly, 
I'm testing you. Are you going to follow my instructions? Listen to what I'm going to tell you. Testing always become, always comes before blessing. You guys hear me? Testing always comes before blessing. Don't expect to be blessed of God if you're failing the test. Testing always comes before blessing. Always. He was testing them. And just as God tested his people back then, he is testing us. Are we going to do things his way? Or are we going to do things our way? Are we going to do what the world says? Or are we going to do what God says? Right? It's so easy to go with the flow. Right? Hey, man, I don't want to make any waves. I don't want to make any waves. I don't, I don't want to cause any issues. But you know what? Sometimes God says, you need to stand up for me, regardless if it may not be the popular or the cool thing to do. And you know what? I thank God for some of the young people who have the integrity to do that and say, you know what? I'm not going to do what everybody else is doing. I'm not going to go where everybody else is going. You know, I'm going to do the right thing. And God says, good for you because I'm going to bless your life. Right? And so the commands and the demands that God makes on your life, they're actually tests. They're tests to see whether or not you will obey him. And sometimes God will even ask you to do what appears to be impossible. Right? Again, another example of this is in Matthew chapter 14, the feeding of the 5,000. Right? Matthew 14, 14 says, Jesus saw this huge crowd, and as he stepped from the, the boat, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. And that evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and get themselves food. Right? But Jesus said, that's not necessary. He says to them, you feed them. Right? But we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. In other words, all we have, Jesus, you want us to feed 5,000 people? We've got two Lunchables here. How are we supposed to do that? You know what I mean? <laughs> so they're looking at Jesus and saying, hey, you, you, how, I mean, come on, Jesus, let's get real here. You want us to feed all of these people with two Lunchables? It's not going to happen. Jesus already knew what he was going to do. But look what it says. It says, but bring them, he says, bring them here, he said, then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. Look what it says. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples, to their amazement, right, picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men uh, uh, were fed that day. Look what it says. In addition to all the women and children. So in addition to the women, that, that could have been like 10,000 people. Five loaves and two fish. He fed 10,000 people. That's crazy. He was asking them to do the impossible. What was he doing? He was testing them. Are you going to trust me? How many of you know that sometimes God is going to ask you to do things that don't make sense to you? He's going to say, you know what? I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. And you're like, oh, I don't know. But are you going to trust him? Sometimes he's going to do things to you that doesn't seem rational to you. But are you going to trust God? Are you going to trust God? Right? I mean, Genesis chapter 12, another example. Abraham, 75, year old, 75 years old. Guess what? Ready for retirement. He's ready to retire. And God says, Abraham, listen. I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave all that is familiar to you. And I want you to go somewhere else. And Abraham says, well, where am I going? God says, well, I'll show you. Well, how do I get there? And God says, I'll let you know, right? Well, how will I know when, I get, when I've gotten there? God says, don't worry, I'll tell you. Listen to what the Bible says, Hebrews 11:8. By faith, Abraham obeyed, and he went. Wow, he did it. See, our faith will be tested and will always involve some risk where you're not going to have all the details. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of one of those people like that want to know details, and God has to remind me, look, I give you promises, not details. 
I promise to do this, but I'm not going to give you the details, right? Some of us are detail-oriented. Well, I want to know step by step. Well, God says, no, I promise you're going to get there, but I'm not going to tell you A, B, and C, and D. I'm just going to tell you, hey, take the first step, and then I'll show you more. Take the next step, and I'll show you more. That's how God operates. And all through the scripture, you can see this. I mean, God did this with Noah, right? Build a boat. He lived in the middle of a desert, and the Bible tells us it hadn't even rained yet. And he's telling him to build a boat, right? But look what the Bible says. The Bible says in Genesis 6, even though people were mocking and laughing at Noah, Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Hebrews eleven seven. by faith, Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God. He did what God told him to do. And so God tests our faith through difficulties. God tests our faith through demands that he makes on our lives. And so as I wrap up this morning, what's the lesson here? What's the lesson? The lesson is is simple. If you're going to live by faith, I must not only learn to rejoice continually in spite of the difficulties, right? But I need to also learn, listen to what I'm going to say. I need to learn how to obey immediately. Let me ask you as parents, when you ask your kids to do something, take out the trash, right? You come home from work, the trash is still overflowing. How does that make you feel? When you ask your kids, can you pick up your shoes and your socks and not leave them everywhere? Yet you come home and then guess what? It's still there. How does that make you feel? It grieves your heart as a parent, right? I remember those days when my kids were young, I'd be like, are you kidding me, right? But... If we're going to, man, live a life that God wants us to live, then we need to learn to rejoice continually, continuously, and we also need to learn how to obey immediately. Don't question God. If God says something to you in his word, just do it, and you'll be blessed. Just do it. Don't question God. When God says it, I need to do what it is, whether I understand it or not, whether it makes sense or not, whether it's convenient or not. That is the test of faith, right? And so let's wrap up right here. But before I close this morning, I want to ask you um, to ask yourselves this question, and I'm closing. How quickly do I respond to what God tells me to do? Ask yourself that. How quickly do you respond? Does it take you a couple of days? Does it take you a week? I mean... How quickly do you respond? You know, do you respond when it's convenient? If that's you, you know, well, you get a one, right? If you struggle with it and you're kind of meandering, you know, but then you end up doing it, okay, I'll give you a five. But if you do it instantly and unquestionably, you get a ten. But how quickly do you respond to God's promptings? And that's what God's been speaking to me about, son, Do what I tell you to do. Say what I tell you to say. Just do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, for your word today. Lord, I just pray, Father, that, God, that we would have heard your voice today loud and clear. I pray that there is no mistaking, Father, that you've spoken to us today about our posture, about how we are to conduct ourselves, how we're to do things, what faith looks like, how to put hands and feet to our faith, God. And so, God, I ask, God, that you would just help us, empower us, convict us in the areas that we need conviction, Lord, that we would begin to do things your way so that we could live the very best lives that you want for us. And this morning, if you're really serious about living your best life, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer. I'm going to say a prayer. It's a very simple prayer, but it's, it's powerful. And don't say it if you don't mean it, but if you mean it, I want you to pray this, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father, by faith and by the enablement of your grace, I'm going to begin rejoicing continually no matter what is happening in my life. 
Because I know you're a good God. And I know that even if things seem out of control in my life, you're in perfect control of every situation in life. And so by faith, I'm going to begin obeying immediately. When I read something in your word, or I hear something in church, hear what the pastor says, or I'm listening to a podcast, or listening to the radio, and I sense you speaking to me about something, God, with your help and your grace, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to do it. I'm not going to procrastinate, but in faith, respond immediately. And so, Lord, use these tests in my lives to help me be more like you, Jesus. I'm trusting you for your help and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we worship the Lord.